All right, welcome to this week's uh, training for the Refuge of Wasp. Before we get to our training today, and by the way, we're going to be incredibly practical in our training today. Before we get to that, I want to address a couple of things, uh, and a couple, I want us to look at a couple of scriptures that I pray will not only edify you, but will help you. This last week has been a week of the ages for a lot of people. I mean, the obvious, you know, the storms that came through, uh, the, the flooding, the tornadoes. I understand that we even had a touchdown of a tornado last night in Broken Arrow. I, went to, I mean, I got so tired of this, I went to sleep, didn't even wake up. And in Sepulpa. And in Sepulpa. Our, our church in Sepulpa took some damage. Wow. Yeah. I mean, just it's been an incredible week. And, uh, but it's not just the stuff that's been happening in the floods. I mean, I've been, I've been talking with a lot of people uh, this week. Uh, to me, it, it seems like this week has been a tornado week. And, I mean, uh, I, I have uh, this next week, uh, as soon as we get through with today, my wife and I and, and Kaden and uh, our niece, uh, Addison, we're getting in the car and we're driving to Jackson, Mississippi. We're getting up early tomorrow morning and we're going down to Mobile. We're going to be there for a week. We'll be back late Friday night. We'll be here for the weekend. And then next Monday, I leave to go do an assessment uh, for uh, church planning. That's very important that I do well on this because if I do well, we, we get some money <laughs> to help us with the, with the launch of the refuge. And so I you know, pray that I do well. This is not a time I need to flunk. I need to pass. <laughs> right? I, I need to do well. And so, so the last few days, I had about three days of work that I needed to get done before we left to go next week so that I could actually enjoy my family when we go to Mobile. But I didn't get done. Every single day, I was dealing with someone's tragedy. And not only that, you know, I'll be very honest with you, by the, the time it got to the end of the week, I was very soured. I was kind of angry. Maybe a little angry at God for, for not giving me the time that I thought that I needed to be able to get certain things done. And have you ever have you ever tried to do something that you thought you thought you were doing it for God? You thought you had the right motives. And then it's you weren't you were prevented from doing it, at least in the way that you had hoped to do it, and then all of a sudden God had to sit you down and teach you a lesson. <laughs> that that was me this week. There were two or three times that I honestly, I mean, you know, I don't believe anger is a sin. The scripture says, do not sin in your anger. There is such a thing as righteous anger. The problem is, most of us, we don't do righteous anger. <laughs> the truth is, most of the time when we're angry, it's a sin. It really is. And, uh, but, but I, I got angry two or three times this week in the midst of trying to help someone. Don't worry, it wasn't you. Okay? <laughs> I promise you, it wasn't you. And uh, there were a couple other people that I was trying to help. That it seemed, I mean, have you ever like just poured your life into someone and it didn't do any good? And I don't mean it, it just didn't help them, but it almost seemed like the, the people that you're trying to help, they didn't care. And you bail someone out and they went right back into the problem and you're like, what, what am I doing there? And, and in the midst of this, I just want to share with you, in the midst of what happened this week, God continued to show up with divine appointment after divine appointment after divine appointment. In the midst of a rotten attitude. And the good news is, is that most of the time this week, I was wearing this t-shirt. And it reminded me, watch out, Scott. You can't, give a bad, you can't give a bad testimony right now. You can't just, I mean, you know, you get bad service, you want to unleash on them, right? You get you know, horrible service, and you want to unleash on, on people. But, but then I thought, well, I can't because I've got this t-shirt on, which is really a tragedy. Because t-shirt or no t-shirt, they ought to be the same. But in the midst of all these things, I want to tell you, God, I, I found myself out at, at Danny's U-Haul. Ever been to Danny's U-Haul? Or you pick. The salvage yard, it's on 46th Street, like you're going, uh, well, it's, it's not far from, from here. And so I was out there in the middle, you know, I was looking for a, for a spare donut tire to help somebody. And uh, they, they didn't really help a lot. They just gave me the sheet of paper and said, going out there. And I, I don't know much about cars. And, and so I'm going through the in and out of all these places, and I, I can't find anything. So I finally resort to asking people for help. Now, granted, when I'm desperate for information, I don't care who you are. I'm going to ask for help. And, and that's the difference between me and a lot of people that I've given counsel for and, uh, that are younger than me. There is nothing wrong with asking for help. No one finds themselves in a successful way that someone didn't help them in some way. I don't care if you think you're John Wayne. 
<laughs> you did not get, you, you never found success without someone helping you along the way. And so I, I, I saw this one guy and I said, listen, I, I don't know really anything about cars. I've got this sheet of paper. I mean, it might as well be written in Latin. I don't know how to get to it. Can you help me? He says, I can't, but that guy over there, he can help you. And so I went over and started talking to this uh, young man. Uh, he, he had a gun on, you know, and I didn't know whether I felt safe or not with him, but he had a gun on and, and uh, uh, on, his, on his hip, and I began talking to him. His name was Barry, and uh, he began to help me. I said, Barry, you are an answer to prayer. I, I said, uh, uh, can I pray for you about anything? He just stopped. And I said, I, I'm, you know, he kind of looked at my shirt, and I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm starting this new church and stuff, and, and, and he said, yeah, you can pray for me. I said, well, what, how can I pray for you? He said, I, I've got drug issues. Just flat admitted it. He's addicted to drugs. And he's got horrible financial issues. I had a chance to present the gospel to him in the middle of a, a horrific day. And, and uh, he said he was a believer, but he had drifted far away from God. And, and, and so we probably talked for about 30 minutes, and I laid hands on him, and I prayed for him. Another day I was out, and I was helping th this, this couple uh, do something, and... Uh, uh, in the midst of helping them, they ran out of gas, and, and I, I was like, you could have told me you were low on gas before you ran out of gas, and, 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 and we're in North Tulsa, or North Peoria, you know, and the sun's about to set, and, and, and I'm just a little bit ticked off again, trying to help, you know, because all I want to do is help, all I want to do is help, and, uh, and, and so as we were doing it, you know, uh, this guy struck up a conversation with, uh, with the guy that was behind his fence, and he just asked him, hey, you don't happen to have a gas can to, to me? And I, I was about to tell this guy, I'm asking for a gas can, we're going to Tulsa, where, you know, the sun's setting, you got to do. You gotta do. And the guy said, yeah, actually, uh, I've got a gas can, you know? And I'm thinking, well, he's not gonna trust us because, you know, the sun's about to set and we're about to leave, and the guy came over and tossed it over the, you know, the thing for us, and I just stopped. I said, listen, and what's your name? He says, his name was Tony, and I said, Tony, I said, I don't know you, but you blessed us today. Is there any way that I could pray for you? And he just stopped. He said, yeah. My fiance has got a disease. And she's going to have surgery. And I'm really afraid. And I had an opportunity to share the gospel with him and to pray over him and give him my card and my phone number and the refuge. And, and he didn't get saved that day, but he received my prayer. And what I discovered is, is if you make yourself available, even if you're having a bad day, God will still use you. Matter of fact, I have said this often, that your testimony is only as good as your attitude on a bad day. Let's put up a scripture that I want you to see here. This is for you, and this is for the refuge too, but I want you to see a couple of scriptures. The first one I think is in 1 Peter chapter 315. It says, honor Christ and let him be the Lord of your life. Always be ready to give an answer when someone asks you about your hope. Now, most of you will say, hey, I can do that. If somebody comes up to me and says, why, why are you happy all the time? You, you, I'll tell them. But I'm not going to start the conversation. I have discovered, matter of fact, I said this on our prayer time last night, that... You know, I can only count two times, and when I say two times, I'm lying because I really don't remember any time. But I say two times because someone's not going to believe what I'm about to say. But I usually say, I can only remember two times that anyone ever rejected me to pray for them. What I really mean, meant to say is that I can't ever recall a time that I've gone up to somebody, started a conversation with them, and said, listen, is there any way that I can pray for you? Every single time, people say yes. And maybe you get rejected. You know, I've never been rejected. Not once that I can remember. But I say there was two times just in case there's error, right? And, and what I'm saying to you is, is that we've got to begin conversations with people. You say, well, that's not what it says right here, okay? Let's look at the next scripture in Colossians chapter 4. All right? Colossians 4 says this. Paul says to the church, never give up praying. And when you pray, keep alert, all right? Keep alert. Keep your mind alert. And be thankful. In, even in the midst of those days that, that you've been knocked down, be sure to pray that God will make a way. Wow, that happened really quick. And uh, good thing is, be sure to pray. It's all right, because i got a backup right here. It's called the leather. i got the Bible. In the, you know, because some people believe that the Bible is only, only the Word of God if it's between two pieces of leather. That's not true, but some people believe that. Because you, know, uh, you can tear this up right here, and the Word is saved, right? Okay. So be sure to pray that God will make a way for us to spread his message and explain the mystery about Christ. Uh, Paul and Peter both said the same message. 
He said, pray for me, just like I would ask you to pray for me as I share the gospel. But it's not just me that's sharing it. It's all of our responsibility. Look, notice what he says. And even though I am in jail for doing this, look at verse 4. Please pray that I will make the message as clear as possible. But notice what he says now. When you are with unbelievers, when you are with unbelievers, always make good use of the time. Be pleasant and hold their interest when you speak the message. Choose your words carefully and be ready to give answers to anyone who asks questions. So it's not just about living a good moral life and hoping that people will come to you and, and ask you to explain the gospel. We've got to share the gospel with them too. Did you know that 50% of millennial Christians, if, if they are Christians, but 50% of those that are millennials, uh, and I think anybody that's under the age of 31 is a millennial, is that right? Somewhere around there. Okay, your kids are. But 50% of millennials that go to church regularly in our evangelical churches believe that it's wrong to evangelize. Half of millennial evangelicals believe that it would be rude of me to come up to Devin not knowing him, begin a conversation, and share the gospel with him. They think that's wrong. You know, that we ought to just live our life a moral way so when people will come up to you and say, man, you're so different. You know, I, I want that Jesus that you have. I want to tell you something. I have had the privilege of leading several people to faith, but I can't recall one time that someone came up to me and said, Scott, you live such a moral life. I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. Not one. The people that have, been, that have accepted Christ have been people that I have shared the gospel with. The Spirit of God began to convict them or someone else shared the gospel with, and I preached a sermon and people came forward. What I'm saying to you is that as the refuge, we, we've got to be aggressive. It's not about turn or burn theology, but we've got to be aggressive about sharing the gospel with people. And, and I want you to know that in the midst of your hard day, yes, you've got knocked down. Yes, you know, life is rough. Yes, things happen. I mean, I heard someone say the other day to me, he said, it seems like every time I try to do something for God, I take two steps back and three steps forward. I've had those days. You've had those days. But I want you to know that it is during those vulnerable times of your life that your testimony is heavier, more weighty, and more meaningful than any other time of your life. Because, you know, a lot of people will, will put hashtag blessed, you know, on their Facebook or their Twitter. i, I got to be honest with you, that kind of ticks me off a little bit. Of course they're blessed when they buy a new car. Of course, they're blessed when they get a new child. And I'm not against a new child. I understand Sammy is at the hospital, maybe having a baby today, maybe not. We don't know, you know. And so, so they're going to be blessed, and I'm not going to get on to them if they put hashtag blessed or anything like that. But, but what I'm saying is, <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is, is God is still just as good when the storm took out your stuff, when you lost your job. He's still just as good. When you become homeless. He's still just as good when you file bankruptcy. He's still just as good when you've been diagnosed with cancer. And I don't rejoice when bad things happen, but I give God praise in the midst of that. And so I, I just want to encourage you today that if you're going through a, a rough time and you will go through rough times, you ought to step back for a moment and be thankful to God because he's about to use your story for someone. And you've got an opportunity. We've got an opportunity. I, I could have followed the flesh easily and be honest with you. I did follow the flesh very strongly during certain times this week, but it seemed like at the very time that I needed to bless someone, at the very time I needed to share something with them, God had knocked me in the head with a brick and opened my eyes and said, here's a need. And unfortunately, sometimes I got back in the car and I just shook my head at myself saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I, 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 you know, I almost missed that blessing. And then I wondered, I wonder how many blessings I did miss this week because of my attitude. It's a word. I want to encourage you with that. I want to continue on with that very same thought. And I'm going to draw some circles on this board. And no, it's not Amway. <laughs> if any of you have ever been to an Amway presentation where, you know, you sponsor people and you get these people in. But I, I'm going to use this. We can, we can kill this, this other thing. How many of you have, have heard of the three circles? It's an evangelism tool. Uh, one person. Has anybody else heard of the three circles? All right, a few of you have heard of the three circles. One of the, the strategies that we have that we haven't even talked about yet, but one of the strategies 
that we have in the refuge is, is going to be our evangelism strategy. And I've chosen the three circles as a tool that I'm going to show you today. And, and I want you to be good students, and I'm going to give everybody a piece of paper, and everybody gets a pen, and I want you to take some notes. All right? So if you've already got a paper and a pen, fine. But if not, God, can you help me uh, give a pen to anybody that needs one? Darlene, give a piece of paper to anybody that needs one. Okay? And uh, we're going to record this as well. And, um, but I'm going to teach you a really simple way of how to share the gospel with someone. And did you know that the majority, uh, I need you to hear this, because I know you're getting pens and you're getting paper, but the majority of people who claim to be a Christ follower have never shared the gospel one time with another individual. Did you hear what I just said? The majority of people that call themselves Christians have never sat down with someone one on one and shared the gospel with them. Why is that? I, I heard someone say several years ago uh, that, uh, Pastor, I'm praying for you because you know you're the man, and and I can't I can't do what you do. And, and since since I can't share the gospel, I'm praying that you can. So I give money and pay your salary so you can preach the gospel. Here's the truth: every single one of us in this room not only need to be equipped to share the gospel, according to the scripture that we just looked at, we need to be ready 24 7. Has everybody got a pen? Does anybody else need a pen? Does everybody got a sheet of paper? How about back there? Do they get pens and paper back there? You can't get away with things. Y'all 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 gotta have it too. I want Rob to have one and I want uh, everybody's gotta everybody's gotta uh, participate here, okay? So Rob needs a paper and a pen right here. Don't you just love me? I'm calling everybody out. Hey, this is the refuge uh, team training. This isn't the church yet. You guys all have to be equipped of what we're doing. And so I want you to take notes. Uh, Tyler, you got one back there? You're, you, you just thought, no, see, back there he needs to see the paper and the pen. And, and I'm going to be looking. No, you can't share with each other. You've got to do it yourself because uh, I want you to have these notes. That's right. I want, I want you to take notes. All right, so, everybody got a piece of paper? Lift up your paper if you got your paper. All right, let's get another one uh, uh, to Mr. Wallace over here. He can't. And okay, Ted, you got to have one too? No, I'm not sharing. I want everybody to get one to Billy. I'm being obstinate. I'm being angled. I realize that. Because I, 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 I want to tell you something. There's something that happens when you write it down. You learn better. You learn more. And I don't believe any of you can simply just listen to it and, and, and have it down. And, and uh, I know that some of you are thinking, well, I'm comfortable with my, with my style of evangelism. I got that. I have no problem with that. But I, I want everybody on the, on the launch team to know how to do this presentation because you never know when you might need a separate uh, presentation to share the gospel. With. Okay? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write some things down. And if you need to use a chair to write something down with, feel free to, to move around and get a chair and you can, and you can take notes. It's going to be pretty simple. All right. Three questions. I'm not going to write these down. You don't have to write these questions down. But I want to give you three questions that I believe that we all ought to be ready to ask anyone at any time. Question number one. How can I pray for you? Say that. How can I pray for you? Yeah. And the reason is, most people that I know won't turn down prayers. And uh, if, if you are talking to somebody and you know them and you have a relationship with them and you say, how can I pray for you? Most of the time, they're going to they're gonna tell you. i got a pain in my leg. Please pray for my wife. Please pray for my kids. Pray for my finances. But how can I pray for you? Second question is really simple. Okay. Uh, Ted. In your life right now, would you consider yourself far from God or close to God? Now, you don't have to answer, but that, that's just the second question. Are you far from God or are you close to God? Great question. Especially as you're talking to someone about the gospel. Because, you know, they're either going to tell you, you know, I'm really close to God or I'm far from God or I'm somewhere in between. Okay? Third question. And this is really the, the important question. All right? Uh, Alan. And we've already had dinner. Uh, but, but Alan... Uh, if I could share with you a picture, Alan, look at me. Look at me. 
<laughs> you, can, you can finish in a second. It's not that great. All right. Okay, do it in a second. Okay, thank you. Alan, if I could show you a picture of something that helped turn my life around and help me to get close to God, can, can I show you that picture? Please, please. Okay. Now, what if he says no? It's all right. You know, uh, if you, you, you know, if he said, no, I don't have time for right now, I'm not going to press him. I've been through evangelism explosion and all these other evangelism things that say, well, if they say no, do this, and make them say no three times. You know, listen, if somebody tells me no, I'm going to respect the word. I'm going to say, okay, Ted, I, I totally respect that. Maybe we can talk another time. Please know that I'm always available to talk to you. You know, I, you know I, is hell in, in jeopardy? Are they in jeopardy of going to hell? Absolutely. But at the same time, you know, no one, you're not a used car salesman, and, and you're not going to talk anybody into heaven. If the Holy Spirit is not there drawing them, there's nothing you can do for true salvation. And so I ask the question, if I could draw a picture for you right now uh, that, that helped change my life and, and, and showed how I became close to God, would you like to see that? And Alan just said yes. And so this is what I would do. So I'm going to draw, I'm going to put up an illustration here, if you don't mind. Write this down in your paper. I'm not going to look at it, but please, please do that, would you please? I would say, Alan, we live in a world of brokenness. Would you agree with that? I mean, our world is messed up. Matter of fact, Alan, our world is cracked. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that our world is messed up. And you just look at all the wars that are going on. You, Alan, you look at the... Uh, uh, you look at what's happening in the country right now with, with politics. You know, I mean, we even heard a testimony today in church about a man that struggled with alcohol. And we live in a world that, that's broken. But Alan, it's not always been that way. Uh, the Bible tells us that when God first made the earth, that he made it with his perfect design. As God's perfect design. And there are still elements, Alan, there are still elements today of God's perfect design. Have you ever been to the Grand Canyon? Beautiful, isn't it? I mean, did you take pictures when you were there? Pictures, they can't describe, they can't describe the beauty. I remember when, when my son and I went out there, I, I took pictures of it, and when I tried, to, when I had them developed, you know, it was like, it doesn't look like that, because it was so much grander. Um, uh, Sammy is about to give birth, Jonathan is about to be wowed out when he becomes a dad. And then when my children were born and I held them for the first time, you know, I, I, I saw a glimpse of God's perfect design. And, and uh, you know, one day the Bible says, you know, that God will make a new earth and, and it won't be broken. But the problem that we have is that we went from God's perfect design to brokenness. And there's a word for that, and it's called sin. And the truth is, you know, Alan... We've all sinned, right? And you know, when I say sin, I'm talking about any time we, we mess up, any time we go against God's word, any time that we, you know, we run from God, you know, we all sin. And, and I, as a matter of fact, the Bible says there's only one person that's never sinned, and that was Christ. And so because of our sin, we entered into this world of brokenness. And so God looked down and he said, I'm going to do something about that. And so the next circle is the third of these circles, and it's the solution to our problem, and Jesus is the answer to our brokenness. As a matter of fact, we know what the Bible says about Jesus. Jesus was God, right? It's what the Scripture says, and it also says that He's perfect. He's the only one that, is, that has never sinned, and uh, we, the story we know is that Jesus, or God, came down to earth as a man, and uh, he became a man so that he could relate to us. But he also came down for one very specific reason. So that he would die on a cross. And he would be that perfect sacrifice for our sins. And, and then the Bible says that on the third day, he came back to life. And as a result of that, God paved the way, Alan, for us to move from brokenness Throw Jesus back to God's perfect design. And Alan, here, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that, that there are two things that we need to do. Time out. Question. I just wanted to say that in one of our classes one time, it was explained that Jesus is the bridge. 
Yeah, and that's a great illustration too. Yeah, uh, yeah. So now back to this. But that's a great, great, great question. That's no problem. And so, Alan, the Bible says there are two things that we need to do in order for us to have our sins forgiven and allow us to go back to God's perfect design. The first thing we need to do is we need to turn. Now, there's a biblical name for that. It's called repentance. And basically what that means is that we need to turn. What do we turn from? We, we turn from our brokenness. We turn from our sin. We turn from trying to do it our own way. You know, a lot of people in the world of brokenness, they're always trying to get out of being broken, right? And so I know a lot of people that try to live a good moral life. The only problem is is that they live for a little while, and then they go back into brokenness. I know some people that try to, uh, they think that if they have a nice job, and if they provide for their family, you know, God one day will wink at them when they, you know, get to heaven. But the problem is that even trying good things break back to brokenness. I know people that get in brokenness, and they get on drugs, and get on all sorts of other things, and addictions, but they still end up broken. And Jesus said we need to turn from those things. And then, second of all, we need to trust. And so, so Jesus tells us if we turn from our brokenness and our sin, and if we trust in the finished work of Jesus about what he did, the Bible says that we, that we will move from brokenness, and then Jesus will take us back to God's perfect design. A wonderful story of this. Alan, when I was 17 years old, I gave my heart to Jesus. And uh, I, I remember I, I was so miserable. It was, I, it was 11 o'clock at night. All my friends were driving Main Street in the town that I lived in. It was my, right before my senior year in high school. And, and I had heard the gospel. I had heard the story many times. But I never came to a time in my life that I truly be, asked Jesus to become the boss of my life. And on June 1st, 1979, by the way, June 1st is coming up next week, I'll be 40 years old as a, as a, as a Christ follower. And, and when that happened, Alan, when I asked God to be the boss of my life, the Bible says that I was born again. It says that I became a brand new creature. And as a result of that, what happened, Alan, is that Jesus, because I turned and I trusted in the work of Christ, he brought me back to God's perfect design. Now, there's two things that God asks us to do after we become Christians. It's really simple. The first one is that he wants us to grow. You know, I, I shared with you that it was 40 years ago that I became a follower of Christ. And so for 40 years, I've been growing in my relationship with God. Because it's not just about going to heaven when you die. There's a lot of preachers that get on TV and say, if you say this prayer, you're going to heaven. And, and that's part of it. But part of it is growing in him. Now, granted, sometimes... It's three steps forward and two steps back. But I grow in him. But the second thing he asked me to do, Alan, and that is to go. Where would I need to go? He wants us to go back into the broken world to help people be rescued so that they might turn and trust in Jesus and so Jesus might bring them back into God's perfect design. So, Alan, let me ask you, where are you right now? Would you be in this world of brokenness? Or would you be in this world of God's perfect design? And you're silent. And you love him answer. No, I'm really broken. Okay. So you would say this is where you are right now. In this brokenness. Just a couple more minutes out. Can I share with you something so simple that a child can understand about how you can move from brokenness to God's perfect design. Can I, can I share that with you? Okay. It's as simple as ABC. All right? And so first of all, Alan, the Bible tells us that we need to admit. We need to admit that we have sinned. We need to admit that we're not perfect. We need to say a prayer to God to let Him know that I'm a sinner and I need to save Him. The second thing, Alan, is letter B. We need to believe. And what do we believe? I'm not talking about head knowledge of belief in what Jesus did. I'm talking about a heart belief. And a heart belief is basically not just saying, yes, I believe that Jesus died and rose again, but I believe that Jesus came and died for me. Adam, if I, you know, let's say that Adam and Eve never sinned, 
and that everybody lived a perfect life. And then in 1962, I was born. I'm telling you right now, I would have been the first person in humanity to sin. <laughs> I'm a really good sinner. And so, so I need to believe that Jesus came and he died on the cross for my sin. And that when the blood was shed, it covered my sin. And then the third thing that I need to do is the letter C, and that is commit. And, and that is that I need to commit my life to Jesus Christ. Alan, does that make sense to you? Now, there's several things that you could do right after that, folks. I could lead Alan in prayer. I don't like having people repeat a prayer after me. I don't like that. I'm not saying that people can't be saved by doing that. I just think that there's a lot of people that just say it out of rope. And so if I were leading Alan in a prayer, Alan, let's, let's roll play. Come on up here, if you don't mind. Alan has heard the gospel. I want you to come here and sit. So you can sit down here. And let, let's, let's role play a little bit. So, so Alan, you, you said that, that that makes sense to you. Would you like me to help you make this commitment to Christ right now? That, that you can know that God will take you out of this broken world and put you in God's perfect design? Really self conscious for all these people. Okay, all right. Well, these people aren't here. Just YouTube Live. Oh, there's only a thousand people watching you. Right? <laughs> I'm really shy on you. Yes, yeah. Okay, so, so Alan, this is what I'm going to do. We're going to pray. And I'm going to help guide you through this prayer time. Okay? All right, so let me, let me pray first, and then I'll guide you. Lord, I want to thank you for Alan. I want to thank you that you are definitely in the process of drawing him to yourself. I thank you for this conversation that we've had. And thank you for the other conversations that we had. And I just pray that you would listen to Alan and hear his heart. And I pray in Jesus' name. So, Alan, in your own words, I want you just to pray out loud and just tell God that you admit that you sinned and that you're sorry for whatever it is that you would tell God you're sorry for. So, just in your own words. God, I, I know that I'm a sinner. I knew that before we started talking. But I, I believe that you, you've made a way for me to make up for that. I think that, I think this man just said that you made up for that. And so I want to thank you for that and accept you and believe you. And then I'd like to commit my life to you like you commit your life to me. Okay, now Alan's a great student because he didn't do what I asked him to do. He, uh, he's a Christian and he's been a follower of Christ and he did the ABCs right there. The normal person would, sit, would simply admit that they've sinned and that they've had problems and issues. And then after he would do that, then I would say, okay, Alan, that's great. Now I want you in your own words to tell Christ that you believe of what he did on the cross for you. And then he would pray that. And then finally, after he got through with that, then I would say, okay, Alan, now let's do the last piece. In your own words, commit your life to Christ. Ask Him to be your Savior. And then I will let Him do that. And then, and then He says, Amen. This is generally what I follow up with. Sorry, I'm bad. You're okay. No, you're not bad. You're, you just live in a broken world. You, you've just been a Christian for so long that you know the answers. Um, then I would actually ask Alan. Uh, Alan, let me ask you something. Where is Jesus Christ right now? I really feel like he's in me. I feel like he's something yeah. in me. And, and why do you say that? It, it, because I've read in the Bible, but also because from what you just said, I just feel like he's 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 done this special thing for me and now just lives with me all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And Alan, there's one reason, one reason only that Christ becomes the boss of our life. If we ask him. And you did. You just asked him to be the boss oh. of your life. And so what this means, Alan, is that you were in a life of brokenness. Jesus, through his work on the cross, brought you to God's perfect design. That doesn't mean that everything's going to be easy, but it does mean that from God's perspective, he has washed away your sin. Now, I'm going to go further on with, with Alan on that. Okay? Let's give Alan an applause. <laughs> but what, what I did, folks, I gave you a simple... Planning. And if you took notes, 
if you, if you actually did what I asked you to do, and you wrote down notes, you can use this very plan to share the gospel with anyone. And, and I, I've been familiar with the three circles for a few years, but I've never used the three circles, just to kind of give you an idea. You know, I, this last week I was, I was looking at all the different evangelism tools, and I just kind of figured that this would be the simplest way that you could sit down with somebody with a sheet of paper, and you could just write it down. And so this is going to be the, the tool that we use to train people about how to share the gospel. But, but let, me, let me say this to you before, before we break up and go to this. If you never share it, not this presentation, but if you never share the gospel, are you sure that Jesus is your Savior? We can't wait for the lost team to launch a church so that we become the church that just lets the pastors share the gospel. There are people I can't reach that you can. There are people that will let you sit down with them and draw these three circles. So we're going to practice this, okay? And we're going to practice it over the next few weeks. And so I want you to overcome your fear. I want some of you to come up here and to do it in front of other people as well. Because if you can do that, you can sit down with that son or that daughter, that grandson, that granddaughter. Practice on each other. You know, I've got a website that I can send you to that you can watch several people do this plan and become proficient in it. And, uh, and let's pray that God opens the door. Because here's the amazing thing. If you make yourself available to people, you're going to have a chance to share this. You're going to have a chance to share it. Questions? Is this the only way? No. There's tons of ways. Roman Road, you know, one verse of evangelism. You know, there's, there's plenty of ways to share the gospel. You know, but I like this one. I like, I like the easy tool so, or the, of the tool. Anybody? Here's your assignment. This next week, take this and practice it. Okay? Uh, email me if you want me to send you the link. I'll be glad to send you the link of, of some places that you can look at. Or you can even watch this, because we'll put this on our YouTube and you, you can watch me do it. And, uh, uh, but, but, but go back to that original document that we sent you that's our purpose statement, our vision statement, our values, and our beliefs. <coughs> Begin to pray through those things again, because from this point on, until the fall, every Sunday we're going to be providing training so that we can be prepared to launch well <coughs> this coming fall with our soft launch. Okay? So let's pray for each other. Let's communicate with each other. Let's ask God to let this seep into our hearts. I want you to bow your head with me, please. And for whoever would feel impressed to pray, I'd like for two or three of you to simply ask God to burden our hearts that we might be willing to share the good news of Christ with people.
example that you've given us That's right. to be able to glorify you and to be able to help others find you in this dark and broken world. Yes. I pray that you just continue to break our hearts, but we'll break yours. Yes. Give us your eyes to see those who normally we would not see and just help us to be available. That's the main thing. Help us to be available through our tough schedules. Help us to be able to see the opportunities that you place in front of us every day. Christ in our We were just uh, to just recognize the moments that you put in front of us so yes. we be able to take advantage of those moments of us overcome our, our fear of rejection, our fear of stepping out of us to just be brave and be able to do this work for you that is our mission as a disciple, and a lot of us do miss a lot of opportunities just because we're afraid to step out of us to just overcome that and uh, just to uh, be able to honor you again and bring more people in here. Thank you, burn in our hearts as really pray the things that you love. And may we distance ourselves from the things that you hate. I pray you bless the refuge today as we go to different places that we would run to the refuge, which is you, and we would be a refuge to people by presenting to you. In Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I have to ask you, even if you're part of this launch team and you're in this world of brokenness and you've never come back to God's perfect design through Jesus, see me. I don't ever assume that just because you're here helping us plant a church that you have been born again. Talk to me. We can nail that down. We can make certain that you are in God's design for your life. God bless you folks. Have a great week. Thank you, Mr.